Today in the EU, who is fit for NATO's top job and why? All eyes are on NATO these days, with the alliance celebrating its 75th anniversary, two new members joining, and its conquest to maintain unity and find a new captain to navigate it through the hot waters of helping Ukraine without being dragged into a war with Russia. Hello and welcome. I am Evitiori, and this is Today in the EU. We're joined by Arely Pugnet, Euractiv's defense reporter, to understand what's happening and who makes the cut. Aurélie, there is a lot of talk in Brussels regarding the departure of Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Can you give us some context on the situation and on what we can expect? I think we still actually don't know what we can expect. Um, so yes, Jens Stoltenberg has been helming the the Western military alliance, as we often call it, NATO, uh, for the past 10 years now almost. His mandate has been renewed quite a few times already, mainly the last two times because of that was during the war mm-hmm. um, in Ukraine. And as we often say, you don't change the captain of the ship in the middle of the storm. Indeed. Uh, so the leaders have decided to to keep Stoltenberg steering the alliance and avoid um, having someone else who doesn't know the rules of the game and doesn't know what to expect out of all the allies and keep him up. Um, the situation is now he has to go. Um, they all agree on it. it it's, his time is up. On October 1st, there has to be someone else. The question is, who is it going to be? But is there a limit on the number of terms a secretary general can serve? Uh, there isn't, actually. Um, you're first given one mandate and then you can have it renewed. And uh, the thing is, at the end of the day, it, it's the allies that decide. And there's 31 of them. And sometimes it's easier to agree on something that's already there. Instead of proposing a new person. Unless they decide that he's no longer fit for the job, then they ju- they can just keep him up forever, actually. And can you fill us in on the details on how the process of picking a secretary general looks like? Actually, it's very untransparent. If you look at the NATO website, it says, well, the selection process is all members have to agree on the next future secretary general. Yeah, but how do they get to an agreement? We actually don't really have an answer. Mm, we know okay. that they all have to have discussions which are very informal and will at the end of the day come up with a name. Now, because all the leaders have to agree, that means that they all come up with criteria for the person they would like to see for the job. And then you come to questions related to the gender of the person or how do they uh, spend their money? Do they spend enough on defense um, in their own country? Um, Are they actually available? And what happens when the members cannot agree on who they want to see there? Well, they have to keep up the same guy. Mm, fair enough. I said, everybody's going to pay. They said, well, if we don't pay, are you still going to protect... And there was a lot of talk about the infamous 2% GDP contribution in defense in the past few weeks. Should the candidate come exclusively from a country that has spent that amount of money or anybody can be a candidate? Technically, you don't have to spend that much amount of money. You don't have to spend the, the, the infamous 2% of your GDP on defense. NATO doesn't have any way to impose that on you. Um, there's no fine if you don't do it. There's no, no one will come and like snap on your fingers. But does that upset the ones that do? What do they say? The member states that do spend that money say, well, it has to be. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the NATO sector general has to come from a country that does spend that money. Whereas when you talk to countries where they don't spend that money, they will say, well, no, you don't have to spend the money because, of course, they, they're going on for their own um, their own interests. Exactly, their own interests. So it's absolutely. a myth. The 2% is a myth. Well, this is the thing. It's like you always use it as, a, as an incentive. No, it's not an incentive. It's an argument, mm-hmm. if you want. It's not a myth. It's an argument for a country to justify why it's pushing for that name. So, for example, you have, well, there was a lot of talks about the Easterners, like um, Estonian Prime Minister Kaya Kallas. So if we want to have peace, then uh, NATO's membership is the only security guarantee and the cheapest. Kaya Kallas has expressed her ambition to being the next NATO chief, promoting unity and peaceful negotiations or um, former prime minister, which is now um, foreign affairs minister, um, Karin of uh, Latvia, saying, well, I want the job, and mm. or I, I would be up for the job. And then, of course, they say, and the person that has to get the job has to come from a country that spends the 2%. But what does that mean, according to you? If you spend the 2%, it means you are serious mm-hmm. about the collective defense of NATO. And this is where countries that that don't spend it will say, well, we are serious about it in some other ways. Now, the good news is actually is that 
everyone will kind of spend it in the end because they all have been increasing their defense spending. So even the countries like, well, the Netherlands, where Macrotech comes from, they were not spending it, but they've pledged that they will starting next year. And was that a consequence of the war in Ukraine? Yeah, absolutely. So they started pledging in 2014 that they will invest more into defense and they will thrive towards those 2%. They did increase spending, but it wasn't very serious. Now, when, of course, there's a war at your border and all of a sudden um, you have to actually produce more and you have to, to, to prove to your citizens that you're being serious about defense. And um, of course, there was the issue of uh, Donald Trump saying, well, I'm not coming and like helping you if you're not spending on defense. So it's a, it's a different mix of uh, reason as to why they're doing it. Things are changing now. I think we're nearing 18 countries out of 32. Yeah, maybe half of the alliance mm-hmm. that will actually reach it, which is quite a high number. Can you give us a bit of an overview on the candidates uh, that people are speculating about? Ooh, so um, there is, of course, uh, Mark Rutte. But does his profile fit the job? I think it does. I do think that he he matches most of the informal criteria that uh, we've been discussing. I think he has one good thing playing for himself, which is the fact that he has been prime minister for so long. I think he's nearing 13 years or something, which is a lot of time to be prime minister. And one uh, criteria that's often raised is you have to be the new Trump whisperer, they call it. So that's a term they use to qualify Stoltenberg already. Wait, what's a Trump whisperer? Um, Trump whisperer basically means you're able to mediate Mm -hmm. between an America that says, well, when we won't spend as much on you if you don't also do the job and you have to share the burden. And it just means making sure that there's no friction and there's no conflict inside the alliance. And that's something that Mark Rutte has been very vocal about. Moaning and whining and nagging about Trump. And we have to work with whoever is on the dance floor. The one thing that really is working against him is that first of all, he's a man um, and has never been a woman. Uh, which is a shame, but besides Kayakales, there aren't many names on the table now. Well, that's what you say, but we don't really know, actually. The suspense here, eh? Exactly, right? Um, the suspense is going to last until pretty much the last second, I think. And Mark Rutte is not particularly liked by the Eastern Alliance. There was a lot of drama the past week with Hungary. So what happened there? So yes, it happened just last week, actually, quite surprisingly, or at least quite sporadically. The the Hungarians said that they would not support someone who previously wanted to force Hungary on its knees, is what Sigital, the foreign minister, tweeted. Harsh. Harsh, very harsh. It's actually a reference to what Mark Rutte once said when he was referring to the violations um, of the rule of law and in democracy in Hungary. And so he said he wanted to bring Budapest on its knees. So it's an internal debate. It's inside joke if it wasn't, I think I would call it that if it wasn't too bad, <laughs> that bad. Um, but it clearly shows that Hungary is really against uh, Mark Rutte. That said, the question is going to be, is this a, a way to get something out of it? Is this a bargaining chip? Mm-hmm. Or are they going to actually really hold that position until the very end. And which candidate would you see the Eastern Alliance uh, promoting? Well, they've really been promoting Kaya Kalas. She's known for her really direct stances on Russia, on supporting Ukraine. She really always says that more defense spending is needed. She's really being promoted, or she has been for the past two years, as a rightful heir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of Stoltenberg. And we've also heard uh, in the past couple of months uh, the name of um, Klaus Johannes, who's the um, Romanian prime minister, another Easterner. One of the big reasons is that the Easterners have been wanting the job for such a long time yeah. that they have to put a name forward. To show that they are serious about it. Even if it's not as a proper candidate and as a proper, like it's a real idea, it has to be thrown in a debate anyways, just to show that Easterners are part of the game and part of the plan and actually want to get something out of it. Uh, but you'll always have the, the Western countries or more Western countries of, of Europe, for example, uh, saying, well, we can't have an Easterner because you to Russian hawkish, and then that risks, that risks creating friction or more mm-hmm. conflict or more aggression or sh- showing some sort of, I don't know what, to Russia that would um, be perceived as a threat. And what's the counter argument to that? From the Easterners? From the Easterners, yes. Well, they will say at the end of the day, NATO is an alliance that is defensive mm-hmm. and it's a military alliance. So of course, if Russia is attacking, one of the NATO numbers will have to defend no matter what. But of course, there are other challenges. Mm-hmm. It's 
it's it's an argument. Um, the question is, out of all those arguments that are being given about the two percent, the gender, the nationality, the party, um, the availability, and all of this. Which one matters the most? I mean, at the end of the day, the Americans have to agree to it, and we have to remember that is you also have to convince the biggest player. Yeah, exactly, and the biggest army actually. What will it take to actually convince them all? I think he's going to have to convince the Easterners that he takes collective security seriously and the threat of Russia seriously, because having not spent that money that they expect him to, and Uh, maybe not being as hawkish or um, something else towards Russia, that may cause some discussions. Um, but he also has to convince um, the, Americans. the Americans, for example, that China is a challenge and that has to be addressed. He has to convince the the East, the, the, the Southerners that uh, terrorism is also taken into account. And there's a thing about the alliance actually is there's only two official threats that are recognized as such at NATO, and that is Russia and terrorism. But also, Stoltenberg's end of term is approaching just after the European election season. Yeah. Will this trigger a reshuffling of the EU stop jobs? That comes back to the criteria of um, availability I was mentioning before, I think. Um, so you have countries like, well, that are not in the EU, like the UK, Canada, the US, Norway, um, that ask that the, the name um, be chosen before the European elections because they don't want the, the NATO section job to be part of any sort of horse trading between the countries and doesn't become hyper-politicized uh, because that's not what you want for the alliance. You don't want it to be politicized. You want it to be very straightforwardly, militarily, and just it's defense alliance and that is it. Um, so yeah, the, the issue that there will be a merry-go-round um, of top jobs at the end or during the summer is clearly a source of concern for them. And so they, that's why they want it fixed, probably in April okay. is what we're hearing, um, the beginning of April. But then they would actually, um, the person would actually take the job only on October 1st, I guess, is, which yes. is when Stoltenberg's term is ended. And the European elections are not going to be the only elections that we will witness this year. We're now full on in the midst of primary season. The US elections are going to take place in late November this year. How do you see that influencing the NATO speak? Yes, definitely. The, the US have to choose also at the end of the day. Um, I mean, the Turks can disagree, the, the, the Southerners can disagree, the Easterners can disagree, but the US has the largest army, has the largest budget, clearly. Has a bigger say. It has a bigger say. They are the ones who will say yes or no at the end of the day. What we hear in the side of the alliance that you want to choose with the current president, Joe Biden, because you can trust him mm -hmm. and you can feel like he would make, or what they say is that he would make a sound choice. Whereas if Trump comes back in November and you don't know what he's got in mind, because no one knows, um, You, you don't know who he's going to choose. And you also maybe want to train the Secretary General to also be able to respond to that mm -hmm. and, and actually talk to the next. Do you think that his Trump's whisper reputation will actually benefit him at this time? I mean, that would be the idea, is that you'd choose someone who can talk to Trump if ever he would come back. And then we say Trump, we mean Trump or anyone who like him, mm -hmm. which means someone who criticizes NATO, who undermines um, the solidarity principle of it, who says that, um, well, potentially they won't support and help militarily any country that gets invaded if they don't spend it 2%. So. And what's the key takeaway on this topic? I think until the name is revealed, we will never know who it's going to be. <laughs> Because y you have too many factors coming in. Um, Is it that top secret? I don't know if it's top secret. <laughs> um, when you have the US saying that they would support Macrota, mm -hmm. it's if someone else better comes along. You know, there's a saying at NATO, like whatever name you hear before the announcement, it's not the right one. Mm -hmm. it's, they're just thrown out there to to throw you off and to make sure that you don't actually catch who it's going to be. The element of surprise. Exactly. A little bit of drama. Yeah, always. I mean, you don't have a lot of drama in NATO, so at least there's one thing that's interesting. <laughs> But maybe this time. <laughs> that is drama that, that is the most dramatic NATO gets. It's a NATO top job uh, series. <laughs> Thank you, Arlie, for your very interesting insights on what is happening behind NATO's closed doors. 
I am Evie Chiori and this was Today in the EU. Visit your active to stay on top of the latest news. Sign up for our podcast newsletter. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was produced by myself, Miriam Sainz de Tejada and Nicoleta Yonta. Thank you for tuning in and we will be back tomorrow. As part of our commitment to accuracy, inclusion and transparency, Euroactive is part of the Trust Project.